Hello, welcome to Ethereal Mechanics video number 13. Uh, this is Newton's Conundrum. And this audience uh, for this video is people have a little bit of circuit knowledge, so it's mostly electrical engineers. Um, this video, we're going to try to go really, really fast because it's a lot to cover in 15 minutes. I'm trying to keep these videos under 15 minutes. Um, I'm going to demonstrate a conundrum in Newton's Laws of Motion, show a similar conundrum in electrical engineering, and the resolution of that conundrum is very interesting. So what's the conundrum? In Newton's first and third laws, so let's take an object, a block of matter. And this is only for the case where you're trying to apply a force to matter. Well, Newton first says if the sum of the forces is zero, then there's no acceleration. That's fine. Newton's third says is that if I apply force to this, the inertia is going to give me an equal and opposite reaction. Well, if it's an equal and opposite reaction, and it's equal, opposite, and simultaneous, meaning instantaneous, well then, shouldn't the sum of forces equal zero and there be no acceleration? That's the conundrum. So let's look at a similar conundrum. This is an operational amplifier configured as, as an in, uh, a unity gain follower. If I put zero in, I get zero out, no problem. The minute I put one in, the output of the op amp wants to go to one volt, which puts one volt here at the inverting opposite. So we get an equal and opposite reaction. So you say, well, how's there a conundrum there? Well, let's look at the op amp, how it's realized. An op amp has a high gain amplifier, typically a gain of one million, and it's got a subtraction circuit. That's the input. So usually this was the inverting input. That's a positive input. Okay, if I put zero in, I get zero out, zero fed back, everything's happy. The minute I put one in, well, then I get a, a positive voltage here, because this is zero. Okay, it's initially zero output. 1 minus 0 is 1. 1 times a gain of a million is a million, but because this amplifier is limited to its, its uh, uh, rail voltages, which is going to be 12 volts and minus 12 volts, the output goes to 12 volts instantaneously. So now we have 12 volts here. 1 volt minus 12 volts is minus 11 volts times a million is minus a million volts, which gets limited to minus 12. So the output just goes like this. It's unstable. So the ideal op amp is unstable. That's the conundrum, because the, out, the, out, the output's going to keep inverting from the input. So how does, what's the solution to the conundrum? Well, I found in my experience that a conundrum is a result from over-idealized models or systems. So the way to fix a conundrum is to make the system less ideal. For the op amp, there's two ways to make it less ideal, either make the reaction less than equal, reduce the gain, or reduce the reaction time, restrict the slew rate. That's what we say. The slew rate is a rate at which the output can change. So let's try the first solution, reduce the gain. Well, I put one in, and I have a gain of only 99. This operational amplifier will stabilize at an output of 0.99. So the input is nearly equal and opposite, and we have stability. But we engineers don't like imprecise stuff, so what we do is we like to reduce the slew rate. So if we take these operational amplifiers and intentionally slow down the rate at which the output can change, um, well, let me first show you. In the first case, this is the input voltage. The input voltage went from 0 to 1 volt, and our output for the initial case without any slew rate adjustment basically went like this. All right, so now engineers said, well, let's slow it down a little bit. We slow down the rate at which the output can change, then it overcompensates, and then just undercompensates until you get this, because it can't change fast enough to be unstable. So if we slow it down even more, slow down the slew rate even more, we get less idling. And you can see, the uh, as you decrease the slew rate, the output becomes more stable. Where you increase the slew rate, it's very unstable. And I'm going to show that in a demo with real op amps to follow. This is a unity follower op amp demonstration. The yellow signal is the input signal to the op amp. There's no op amp in the circuit right now. The blue is going to be the output of the op amp. Uh, I can change the input uh, with this control over here. Uh, we've got three different kinds of op amps. One with a slow slew rate, which is a 741, which is a half a volt per microsecond slew rate. Okay, and you can see that the output signal looks identical to the input signal as far as we can tell by the screen. Now, just so you know, I've made this circuit intentionally uh, poor, poorly. Long circuit leads, no bypass capacitors, to show you that 
uh, the environment also has a condition on the stability of an op amp. Now if we replace this slow slew rate op amp with a higher one which is an LT1037 which has a slew rate of 11 volts per microsecond, okay we get a, a similar output but now you can see that there's a lot more fuzz on the blue trace than there was with the 741. Now if we go to a much higher slew rate, a thousand volt per microsecond which is an LT1363 uh, you can see we're pretty much unstable. That ends this demonstration. Alright, now let's compare what we just saw. For the 741 op amp, which is a half a volt per microsecond, the slew rate, these are all proportionally drawn slew rates. And you can see it's very slow, but compared to what we saw on the oscilloscope, it looked like it was pretty instantaneous, didn't it? Well, that's because in our perspective, the amount of time it takes for five, half a volt per microsecond is imperceptible to us. And we saw with the LT. Uh, 1037 we saw a little bit of fuzz, it was marginally stable on the output, just you saw that idling that occurred. And then we went to the 1363, it was a thousand volts per microsecond and it was very unstable. Okay, now granted we made the environment so these things would be less stable than normal. So the environment has something to do with the stability of things. So what does all this have to do with Newton? Well let's look at inertial slew rate. Okay, we said that matter, and this is our synthesized cannonball here, matter is comprised of inertialess particles, denotated here by these M&Ms. I used all orange M&Ms to make it look simpler. The color has nothing to do with it. Now, if we consider that we are trying to apply a force to this cannonball, because the density of the inertialess particles are far from each other, therefore the field interactions take longer. Therefore, as I and try to push on this, the interactions take a long time to build up inertia before this whole thing starts to move. Okay, so that would be a very long slew rate. Now if I add more inertialist particles, I'm going to use green just for contrast. Okay, my the as I push in, I'm going to incur, encounter more particles at a higher rate and therefore the reaction is going to be more intense inertia. Okay, but if I go all the way to something like on an octium, it's going to be unstable from the outset. Now let's hope I can go on with this demo here. So let's compare these slew rates. Okay, let's say something like carbon has a low density of particles and therefore it's in a very stable region and because it's in a very stable it reacts very quickly to an applied force. You get to a heavier item like plutonium which is marginally stable, it's more assertive to opposing an applied force. And then you get to your unanoctium, which only has a half light of 190 microseconds, it's very unstable. Okay, so we conclude from this that an ideal response to an applied force would be a perfectly equal and opposite and instantaneous reaction. But unfortunately, uh, ideal matter has would have infinite density, and ideal matter would be unstable, and ideal matter, if, if stable, would not be movable. So real matter is less than ideal. Uh, as it gets less than ideal, it's easier to accelerate and is very stable. Somewhat ideal matter means it's, it's more dense, is harder to accelerate, and is less stable in general. I mean, the environment and the structure does have an effect on stability, but in general, a heavier item is less stable. And again, environmental conditions and structures contribute to stability. Uh, the delay in the inertial response of matter will be computed in a later installment. For the present time, we're just going to use the ideal models. So what did we learn? The inertial reaction to accelerate an object cannot be simultaneous. This resolves the conundrum. The more lag there is, the easier an object accelerates. As the lag time decreases, matter becomes less stable. So what's next? Uh, the next video we're going to do, uh, Gravity Violates Newton's Third Law. That's a very interesting one. And then we're going to talk about the properties of inertialist matter and wrap it all up with Newton in video number 15. Number 16 is going to be the antenna paradox. I recommend that for my antenna engineers. We're going to skip 17. Uh, 18, we're going to introduce new induction and new magnetism. 19, we're going to talk about the, lumer, the old ether model, the luminiferous ether, and the Michael-Simorley experiment, which was supposed to measure the ether. Uh, 20 begins 
uh, in theory mechanics in proper. We're going to do a th uh, reciprocal thinking. And then t video number 21, you do not want to miss. You do not want to miss video number 21. Thank you. Uh, where's my controller?